Hey guys, it's Nana, and let's talk about the books that I read in February. So I only finished two books in February, but they were excellent, and the reason that I haven't finished more books in February is because I started The Count of Monte Cristo. I'm buddy reading this with Amory, and I'm loving it, but also, guys, look how big it is. So I don't know, I, I thought maybe I could finish it this month, but that's not gonna happen. I am on page 648, so nearly halfway. I realized when I went home to California over Christmas that I owned an edition, so I have read an abridged version of this before, but I've never read the full version, and I've seen the movie so many times. I think the movie is great. So it's been really awesome to read the book and discuss it with Amory. It's a lot of fun, and I've been posting lots of Goodreads updates, so if you want to see where I am in the book, that would be the best place to check. Back to the books that I actually finished. So first up is a novel that I could not even describe in the book haul, and now that I've read it, I'm still not sure I can describe it, but I'm gonna give it a go. And that's Sudden Death by Alvaro Enrique. So I won this arc in a giveaway from Goodreads and Riverhead Books, so thank you very much to both of them for letting me have a chance to read this book. So, okay. All right. Here goes. So the book is about a tennis match between Francisco Quevedo, the Spanish poet, and Caravaggio, the Italian painter. But it's not about that really at all. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the structure. Throughout this novel, the tennis match between these two famous artists is happening. In between the tennis match, we jump around to different historical events, and we jump in and out of different narratives. The book is structured with really short, brief chapters. Some of the chapters will be focused on the tennis match, and then we will jump to the time of the conquistadores and a narrative with Hernán Cortés, and we'll jump back in time to before Quevedo and Caravaggio met, and then we'll jump forward in time. So we move all over the place, and like the tennis ball and the match, we ping-pong from story to story. So about 30 pages into this, I was like, I have no idea what's going on, and you just kind of have to accept that you're gonna be a little confused, a little disoriented, and just go along for the ride. I have to say, I really enjoyed this. It's very different from a lot of things that I've read, both in terms of the structure and the voice and the style. The author loves to toy with reality. So we have historical figures, actual people, but then there are speculated conversations and imagined histories and imagined backgrounds. It becomes difficult to tell what is real and what the author has made up. Woven into the story are bits from historical texts that the author was researching when the idea for this novel came to him, and also there are emails with this editor, just all sorts of different media captured in here. And this is not a long book, this is a very short book. I went to a talk with the author and someone mentioned that there are all these historical objects that appear in the book. For example, the tennis match is played with a ball that is made out of the hair of Anne Boleyn. So after Anne Boleyn gets beheaded, they gather up her hair and fashion it into a tennis ball. What? Like, totally bonkers, right? But I think, I believe that part is true. This ball did exist. The author kind of said that he didn't know what this novel was going to be about. Well, the narrator says that too within the story. He's like, I don't know what this novel is about. When I saw the author speak, he said that the novel is a proposal and it's up to the reader to interpret, you know, draw meaning from it. The narrator says within the book, I don't quite know why I'm writing this, but I want to illuminate some things and I may not have all the answers, but I'm I'm gonna tell you what I do know, that sort of thing. So very interesting ideas about the relationship between the writer and the reader. Also, this book is funny. There are bits that just, you know, I couldn't help but chuckle at. And it's funny to say that because this is a book that deals with time periods of brutal violence. He talks about Cortez and the conquistadores and the Aztecs and how in conquering people they basically wiped out an entire nation. So there's a lot of violence and brutality, and when I heard him speak, he said that humor is a tool to cope with that. You know, here are all the terrible things that happen, but you need a moment of humor, a moment of relief from everything that's weighing you down. So we also talk about art in here, and how the artist creates, and what it means to be an artist, 
and what the artist's role is in the world. He also talks about sexuality, and at the event he said he was playing with this fluid sexuality that did exist during the time period, but just people didn't talk about it. It was the kind of thing where, oh, everyone knows, but no one talks about it. So there are some interesting dynamics between certain characters regarding sex and power and control. And let's talk about language. He talks about the difference between Spanish spoken in Mexico and Spanish spoken in Spain and how subtle differences tell you a lot about the two different cultures. He also talks about translation and how meanings can get twisted from one language to another, whether on purpose or on accident. There's so much going on in this book and I would say it, it was a pretty fast read because the chapters are very short, but also I kept stopping to look up things because I was like, oh I don't you know, I don't remember that from my history class. It deals with the period of the Counter-Reformation and different figures and he talked a lot about Caravaggio's works and I wanted to look them up and have a picture in my mind as he was describing them. So I was constantly stopping to Google things and I wanted to learn more. I, I want more people to read this so I can talk to them about it. There's just so much to discuss and so many interesting ideas that the author kind of puts in front of you. Yeah, so if you read this one, I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts or let me know if you want to read it. I feel like there's so much more that I could say about this, but I don't know how to say it properly. So. This was a really excellent read and I gave it four stars. The second book I picked up was for Black History Month and I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this is the first book that I'm reading by this author and that's The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Somehow I have made it through 26 years of life and I've never read any Toni Morrison until now. I, I can't explain it but I finally remedied that and I picked up, I believe this is her first, yeah this is her first novel. I'm starting at the beginning. So when I finished this novel, gosh, was I sad. I mean, I just felt so heavy after reading this. This is about a young black girl named Pekala, and what she wants more than anything in the world is to have blue eyes. Because blue eyes are beautiful, and she thinks that if she can get blue eyes, she'll be treated better, and she'll just have a better life. Oh man. Where to start with this? Of course Toni Morrison is raising questions about race and class differences and beauty and society. I will say that it, the story wasn't quite structured the way I thought it was gonna be. There are terrible things, there are lots of terrible things that happened in this book and I'd always thought that it focused on one of these in particular but really it doesn't. So the story is told from the perspective of this young black girl who is friends with Pekula and near, lives nearby. So we don't actually ever hear from Pekula herself, which I think is so sad because the story is mainly about her, but she doesn't have, in her life and in the story, she doesn't have any sort of voice. And then from there we kind of bounce around in time and go back, I guess, generations and we see how Pekla's father was raised, how her mother was raised, and basically all of the events that kind of lead and guide the characters to what happens in the end. So at the time we meet Pekla, she is living in a household where her father is a drunk and her mother has basically abandoned them. So her life is not great to begin with and we see it steadily get worse and worse. Just in every situation she is beaten down in one way or another and you can't help but feel terrible for her because she doesn't deserve this. No one, no one deserves this but she, especially a child, does not deserve this. Pekala wants blue eyes because white girls have blue eyes and White girls are blonde and pretty and everything in life is perfect for them. This idea is reinforced by everything that happens to her in her life. There's one scene in particular where Pekala goes to visit her mother who works for a white family and takes care of their kids and cleans the household and there's an accident in the kitchen. Pekala gets blamed and her mother rushes to comfort and care for the white child over her own daughter. That just made me so angry because her own mother is reinforcing the idea that she is less than. Toni Morrison also talks about black people who are disgusted with themselves basically and hate their own blackness and how they treat other black people because of that, because of their own inner hatred. I think there's a lot to identify with in this book. If you've ever felt different and you just wanted to be like everyone else and assimilate with everyone else, you, you know, I think you'll 
you'll feel for Pekala and you'll understand a bit of what she's going through. People are obsessed with a certain idea of beauty. Society has created a certain ideal and then it's perpetuated throughout history. Gosh, I'm just so glad that I finally picked up a Toni Morrison novel. It was beautifully written. There was just such a strong feeling of despair and hopelessness, but don't let that put you off reading the book because I think it's so good and so necessary. Love this one, gave it four out of five stars. Other things I wanted to mention, I recently discovered this Twitter slash Instagram account called Well Read Black Girl and she highlights writing by black authors so I will leave a link down below. I think you should definitely check that out. The month of February may be over but there are some books that I wanted to read for Black History Month but didn't get to yet so I hope to pick them up in March or sometime soon. And on deck I have Between the World and Me by ta Coates which I still have not read. I need to fix that stat. And I also recently bought we Love You, Charlie Freeman by Caitlin Greenridge, I believe is the author's name. It's a debut novel and I've heard really good things so I'm excited to pick that one up. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Tell me about the books that you read in February. Have you read any of the books that I talked about in this video or do you want to? About Toni Morrison, which of her books are your favorite? Where should I go next? What should I read next by Toni Morrison? Let me know down in the comments below. If you want to talk to me elsewhere, I am on Goodreads, Twitter, Instagram. I will leave my links down below. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!